Hello, everybody. Uh, just a quick introduction for you. Um, I'm Mark Stebbin. Um, I am a I work on the development services team um, here at the Q. Just a little background on me. Um, I'm six years as a web developer. Um, before the Q, I was at a large insurance company as an accessibility software developer. Um, in my niche, the last like four years um, has been doing um, research and kind of development in JavaScript frameworks um, for accessibility. Um, and I also work a lot with accessibility automation testing for developers. So we are all here today um, to go over React and accessibility. So the cool part about this, I'm gonna tell you guys full disclosure, um, I love this topic, I do. Um, this has been one that has piqued my interest since I started doing research on about four years ago. Um, the great thing about it is it's, it's, it's so divisive amongst the accessibility community. And what I mean by that is, is a lot of people are either on one side of the spectrum or not. It's either, hey, it is accessible, you can make it accessible, or hey, it's not. There's not a lot of middle ground. So what I hope to do today is kind of get, if you're on one side of the fence or the other, kind of bring you to that middle ground, right? Um, because inherently that's where we want to get to with this. So when we start today, our agenda for the day is going to look like this. We're going to do a quick React accessibility overview. Really, it's just an overview of how JavaScript frameworks and React work um, in general. We're going to talk about the myth of React and accessibility. We're going to talk about the general accessibility issues. We're going to go through each of the main issues. Um, now, there are a load of issues that exist within JavaScript frameworks like React. Um, we're going to cover probably about the six or seven main ones. Um, they exist, but there's small little ones within those that we'll talk about as well. Um, and then to wrap it up, we'll talk about framework support for accessibility. Um, that's helpers that are within the React framework out of the box itself. Um, and then helpers that exist as far as testing and third-party packages, right, that you can download from Yarn or Node. So, React and accessibility overview. So, for some of you that are on here, this is going to be a review. Um, but for some people who are trying to understand where these issues come from, we kind of have to give some background on how React works in general. So, um, overall, React has been very conscious of accessibility. Um, and unfortunately, it does get a bad reputation in the accessibility community because it falls under a JavaScript framework, or for some people who have heard it as a single page application, right? Um, the way that these JavaScript frameworks work inherently is like this they're basically one single frame, so one index.html file that loads, and then scripting behind the scenes will basically dynamically inject these things into the page. So there is no refresh behind the scenes, um, and there's not a lot of content in the DOM of the load of the page. What I mean by that is the traditional way of web has been, if I had a modal, um, I would hide the modal um, on the screen. It would be in my physical rendered HTML or in the DOM. Um, when it was called, I used CSS, right, to show it and hide it. Um, that's not the case with JavaScripting frameworks, right? Um, a lot of this stuff is not in the DOM. Um, it's actually loaded after the fact. And so what we end up with um, is the issue that these things don't exist. And screen readers struggle to pick these things up um, as they go through. And technically having one page load does cause some major issues for screen reader users, right? And not only that, just uh, keyboard only users, many different users it causes issues for. Um, the idea of these was to speed up sites by putting more onus on the client side. So instead of doing the traditional way of reaching out to a server, a server pulls back the page. Now everything's on you. It's pulled to the client side to speed up that process. Um, and the other thing too is dynamic data. Dynamic data does allow for more data to be put onto your page. So it does allow for data usage to kind of go a little bit faster. Um, and it makes it easier on you to see more data within your website. And control that data. So that's kind of the background on where these issues kind of come from, how uh, JavaScript frameworks work. But let's talk about the myth of accessibility in React. Um, React has developed this big stigma within the accessibility community that web applications created in React just straight up are not accessible. Um, there's lots of accessibility advocates, but the one that shocked me more than anything is that even developers who develop in the firm, maybe they're not accessibility advocates per se. Um, they find that accessibility within it is, is almost impossible to achieve. And that's where this stigma comes from is that developers themselves are coming back and saying, hey, this does not make any sense to me. I can't make this content accessible. I, you know, working in the area that I do within DQ, we get a lot of dev remediation questions. And this is one of them. A lot of people say, I can't do that, right? And what it came down to when I started to look at this was React can be as accessible as any other framework out there. Right, it just takes a knowledge and a willingness to do it, right? So think of it like this. Even if I'm coding in regular HTML, right? I can still make buttons with divs. I can still make tables without proper table semantics, right? 
I can do that. It's my choice to use semantic HTML, right? Same thing goes with React. React started out as this thing where you could do all this cool stuff with divs, with solves, all this cool stuff, right? I can make these really cool widgets, inject data, I do all this stuff, right? It's awesome. But what was forgotten about it is that you can actually just use semantics just like you would with regular HTML, right? And that stigma that's out there right now um, is trying to get written away, um, even from the React development team themselves. You can use semantic HTML, you can do all the things that you can do with regular web development within React itself. So we're gonna jump into some of the general accessibility issues that exist within this itself. Now, this is gonna be a large chunk um, of what we're gonna talk about coming up. Some of the main issues are these, page view titles, as simple as that sounds. It is a huge, huge issue within single page application or JavaScript frameworks like React. We're gonna talk about focus management. Um, focus management is a large issue within it as well, right? Because stuff is not within the DOM itself and it's getting injected or dynamically added to the page, where do I put focus? Where does focus go when I change pages, right? Um, keyboard navigation and events, right? And when I say keyboard navigation, this is just keyboard use in general within these applications, right? Um, what happens if I'm a keyboard only user and I just kind of use stuff out of the box, what ends up happening? We're gonna talk about a couple of different scenarios um, that exist with keyboard navigation. And then we're gonna talk about dynamically added content. Um, mainly dynamically added content, we're gonna talk about the use of ARIA Live <coughs> and the role of alert. Um, when we talk about this, we're really just looking at it from a perspective of ARIA Live is a great tool to use for dynamic data content. However, within JavaScript frameworks, it gets a little tricky, um, but we will kind of talk about specifically how we can remediate those issues. And then component libraries. Um, document and heading structures, buttons, tables, links marked up without native HTML tags. Component libraries and packages that people download directly from NPM or Yarn cause major issues within your project. Um, and it does make for a very difficult time um, getting to an accessible application. So with that, um, I'm actually going to jump out of this PowerPoint slide that I have right here. Um, and I'm gonna jump into this application I've created. Now this application I've created um, is actually public. So if you go to Google and search React Alley example and then Code Sandbox, you can actually access this project itself. Um, it's totally, open to anybody to use. Um, you can't obviously change it, um, but within this, you can see the changes we're gonna talk about today. So the first item we're gonna talk about is page titles. Um, page titles in general, as simple as, as simple as an accessibility fix as it sounds, right? The old school way of doing it is just having a title tag, right? It's not as simple in, in React. React, you have components that are made into pages. So for instance, in this case I have up here, I have a component that I call page title, and it's my page component, okay? So within this right now, there's a couple different ways I can actually do um, this content. What I'm gonna show you are three different ways to do it, um, two of which are super acceptable. The other one is not as acceptable yet, um, but I do like to have it as an option just in case your application is set up that way um, to do it. So the first one is just gonna be using something that's called the document title package. So what I did, is I went out to NPM or Yarn and I actually downloaded a React document title. What this does, it'll actually pull this into your project and all you have to do, wherever your page component is, all you have to do is take this document title tag, wrap it around your content, or just put it up top of your very return statement within your render um, and just set your title equal to whatever the title of the page is gonna be. So for instance, I'm going to jump now to the actual physical page um, if I look, my title fixes page is up top, right? And title fixes page is my title fix, right? Um, the cool thing about it is when you jump in React from page to page, you'll notice I'm gonna jump around from my home page to my focus management page. You'll notice that there's no title being set. Now I'm gonna jump to that same page title page and you're gonna see that I actually have a page title that gets set. Yes, it is delayed just a little bit, right? but that is the idea behind it, right? You're still getting a page title that allows the user to understand what page they are on. Um, this is one of the more popular ways. React themselves actually um, tells this one pretty well. I'm saying you should use React document title. But again, thinking about it, there are different ways to do this, right? So let's say you can't necessarily pull in a third party um, library into it, right? I can't use React document title, that's fine. Um, there's actually a component lifecycle that exists within React. Um, you're gonna hear me say this a lot as we go through this content, the life cycle basically is the entire life cycle of the component you have. So for instance, on this page, I have the components life cycle for this page itself. 
there's multiple different things you can do with it. So this function I'm looking at right here is component did mount, okay? And if I look at component did mount itself, okay, this is part of the life cycle. So once this component mounts, I'm going to do something, do some action. This is where you can do some third-party JavaScript and stuff behind the scenes and make it easier on yourself to make those changes. Component lifecycle does a bunch of different things. There's component did mount, there's component will mount, there's a component will update. Right? There's a bunch of different things you can do with it. In this case, I'm just going to use component did mount and do this. This is with no packages straight out of the box. I'm going to do document dot title. Okay. And I'm going to set this to Mark is awesome. Okay. And I'm going to save that. I'm going to come back to my page again. I'm going to reload. Ta-da, Mark is awesome, right? And right there, that's React out of the box. I have not added any third-party libraries. I've done nothing. All I'm using is the component lifecycle and document.title, and then my title is put out there for me, okay? So that's the second option. Third option, um, you can use something that's called React Helmet. This is actually created by the NFL. Now, I'm gonna go to this page on here and just show it to you guys and kind of talk through it because the use of it within my code sandbox is really difficult. Um, but it may be different for your guys' application. So what Helmet does, just so you guys understand, um, and believe it or not, it's called Helmet because it was created by the NFL. Um, what Helmet does is it allows you to actually set the top level head piece of it, so your head tag. Um, it allows you to set the meta, the links that you might have within it. For instance, if you have like style sheets, things like that, you want to link to it, and you can set the title within it. Um, so that is a third option. It's a little bit more difficult to implement. You do have to have your project specifically set up in that way. Uh, but it is a third option to go through to it. So again, the most popular options are um, the one that we just showed before, um, which was specifically um, the document title, right? React document title. And the other one is just using document title out of the box. It makes it really simple and straightforward for you to be able to jump in and out of those issues. And then also use, if you need to use React as a whole, and you can't use a third party library, you can jump and just use right to it, right? Okay, so that's issue number one. We're gonna jump into issue number two, um, which specifically is um, the actual focus management. Now, this one gets, I'll say this, it gets a little tricky. Um, so you're gonna have to bear with me on a couple of these things as we go through them. But when we look at focus management, okay, there's a number of different things you can do with managing focus. Remember, a lot of the stuff we see within React is not there, okay? when we do some sort of action. So for instance, okay, if I click something or I type in my name, you guys see this a lot. We see a lot of different things where like you sign up for an email, right? And then right away, instantly you get this feedback. It's like, hey, you signed up for this email, right? Um, but what ends up happening is a lot of times that's already there, right? So you get an ARIA live or maybe CSS removes it and then boom, it appears. What ends up happening when content just appears and it's not there? What do you do, right? So there's a couple of different things you can do specifically for managing focus with dynamic content. One of them is again, to use the component lifecycle. Um, so in this case right here, um, I'm gonna manually manage my focus. And what I mean by that is, is I'm using the function component did mount, which I'll show you guys here in just a second. And all I'm doing is running JavaScript behind the scenes to control it. So I'm gonna type this text. I'm just gonna type Mark is awesome again. And I'm gonna go down here, I'm gonna submit. Boom, thank you, your information has been received. I have controlled focus with just JavaScript behind the scenes now, okay? So if we look at the actual code specifically for that, so I'm gonna to jump to my focus page, yep. I'm gonna jump down into, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, and enter my text. There it is, hello. Um, cool, so there's my submit text. Type some text here, okay? And then all I'm gonna do is basically say, if this, right? If this is gonna be true, which is gonna show it manually, okay, this dot on manual click, on manual click is my function, okay? My function is basically gonna say, hey, control my state behind the scenes, right? So a manual state, okay, for this alert component that I've created, which I'll jump into in a second, I'm gonna set it true and it's gonna show that. So now if I go to this component that I've created, okay, which is just an alert text, alert text components are really common for people to use, okay? Um, on this alert text itself, when this component mounts, so when I say it mounts, if I go back to my example here, when I click this submit text, when I type some text in here, that's when it has mounted. All I'm doing is saying this dot alert text and then focus, okay? Which alert text in and of itself is just the name of the component itself. And I'm saying, hey, put focus directly back to this, right? And allowing it to put focus directly back to that thing. 
that is one of the more common use cases. Um, if you can use that, it's very straightforward and easy. It's using React's framework itself. You don't have to download any third party options for it. Um, it does make it really easy to go through. So that's using it with specifically components did mount. So the life cycle of the component itself. Um, the other one that's really nifty, I'm gonna skip over modals right now because I know modals on here. I'll go to that in just a second. Um, the one that's really nifty is autofocus. Now, there is a thing with autofocus that I have to tell you guys about because if I did not, I wouldn't be doing my due diligence, okay? Autofocus works like this. If I click a button or submit a form, okay, and I put this lovely tag, so I'm gonna go to this really quick. So let me go to focus. Uh, da, 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 da. I gotta skip modal. Sorry if I'm making you guys sick on here real quick. There we go, okay. I'll put this lovely attribute on this input, okay? And just this autofocus, all right? This is out of the box. This is directly from React itself. Now, if I click this autofocus, okay? If I click this input and I click this button right here and it shows this input, what ends up happening is the first time that this renders, it will put focus directly to it. So where a good use case is this for, if I open up, okay, and submit part of a form and another form appears, or I answer a question and more content appears below that, um, I can actually hit this button and focus will go directly to that. So let me tab down to this, hit enter, boom. My focus has gone directly to that input right there. Okay. And the idea behind it is, is this, if you do have those subforms, it allows you really quickly, just one attribute to let react do its thing, click it and then go, here's the catch. Okay. Let's say I am a user and I go backwards. Now I shift tab and I go back to this and I hit it again. Nothing happens. Focus does not go to that input box. So it's a one-time thing. So I show this because a lot of people have this, um, speculation that autofocus works every single time. It does not. It only works in the first trigger of that. There are ways to manipulate this to where you show and hide every time. So for instance, you could hide it, then show it every single time. Um, it's a lot more code to do that, but it is nifty if you need a quick way out to get focus to an input field. It only works directly on an input field. So most people who've seen this, I've seen use it, use it on the first input field, um, or even use it when they appear um, a sub form, or maybe you want somebody to go directly to that when they click a button, right? It only works in the first shot, okay? So that's kind of manually managed focus, using autofocus inputs on um, the big one. They always say this, we've done multiple calls to people as you mark, how in the world do you do modals, right? Well, specifically for accessibility wise, if I get focus in my modal, my focus is trapped, I can't get outside of it, right? And I close it and it goes back, I'm in good shape, okay? From an accessibility standpoint. But how did I do this? Well, the cool thing about this is this. A lot of times what we end up getting from clients is we get a lot of people that end up creating custom modals, which is fine. Modals are very popular. They're from an accessibility standpoint from React. They do get a little bit difficult to actually put together. The cool part about this, okay, if I'm gonna show this to you guys really quick is um, React actually has a modal that it does support itself. It's called React Modal. Um, and out of the box, it is 100% accessible. Let me rephrase that again. Out of the box, it is 100% accessible if you choose to use it properly. All you have to do is basically tell it with whatever button or whatever trigger you're using, when you want it to show, you bring the modal tag in, you can do whatever you want to inside the modal, okay? So whatever that is, you can add a button, you can add this, you can add whatever you want to to it, okay? As long as you have the modal tag, okay, tied to it, you can put whatever you want to on the inside of it, and the modal itself, as long as you set is open, right? And tell it where you want it to close, you can actually get this to be 100% accessible. So this integration that I have right here, I'm showing you, I have used and given suggestions for it to multiple people. Yes, it may take, if you guys do have custom modals, it may take some time to redesign. I get that, okay? But this does get you 100% accessibility with it, okay? Again, I'll show it to you. So I just went down to here, I click this. I'm telling the modal, this is the end of my modal, this right here. So it's not gonna take me anywhere outside of it. And then when I hit close, there's a function provided by this modal from React that actually takes it back to the previous state. It is awesome. You don't have to code any of this stuff. Now, I'm really happy pathing you. I understand that 110%, right? There are some instances where you do not have the ability to bring in a third party or it's a large chunk of stuff to do, right? Again, I'm gonna sound like a broken record as I go through this. You can use the component lifecycle to do a lot of this stuff. If you have a custom modal when it appears, simply use that uh, component or use the uh, 
<clears throat> component lifecycle, okay, to actually say, hey, after this is open on component mount, go and put focus directly into my actual modal, right? You can do that. That's perfectly acceptable. Is it more code? Yes. Um, but you can do that, especially if you're in too deep and you do have a lot of content there. Allow yourself to be able to do that, okay? There is nothing wrong with doing the component lifecycle and using JavaScript to do stuff behind the scenes. There isn't. A lot of people, when I say that, tend to start to like shudder and like cringe at me when I say that. It's okay. You're not going to speed it down. You're not going to slow down your application. It's okay to get your content accessible. Sometimes you do have to make that sacrifice and do that. Um, so those are multiple ways that you can manage things with focus. Now, this is another question I always get asked. And it's a great question. It is. It's a phenomenal question. What do I do when I change a page? So we talked about this early, right? When I change a page in React, right? I'm, and you guys can't see, I'm doing air quotes with my fingers right now. When I change a page in React, as far as focus goes, focus kind of just goes wherever it feels like. So right now, I'm just going to tab and go to this focus management, which is in my left navigation on my page. I'm going to hit enter. Cool. Right now, my focus is being controlled, okay, and staying on those links. But a lot of times within React itself, if I hit like this home button link, focus just will go wherever it feels like, right? And the cool thing about React is going back to that component lifecycle. If on every single page or route that I go to with it, I can actually just tell it, hey, I want you to go to the header, right? The first heading that's on the page. So the H1, right? Go to that. So the user knows the pages has changed. I have also seen people do an ARIA live piece to tell them that the page has changed. It's not as good, I will tell you that, as just putting focus to something that's gonna be your main content. Other people have just put it back up in the header as well. Um, similar to like a page refresh, right? but some way to let them know the page has changed. Because a lot of times what's happening is a user will just go to this content, tab down through, hit it, and then be like, uh, uh, where am I, right? So it can get a little bit confused. That's one last thing with focus management we can do. So we talked about four different things with focus management, right? Um, and kind of playing off of focus management um, is keyboard navigation because they kind of play hand in hand together. Um, so I'm going to jump down to this HTML semantics page. So. Um, Full disclosure, when I say keyboard navigation, I do mean anything that has to do with using React with just keyboard only, right? So this first example I have up here, um, I'm gonna talk about something that's not well known, but I do wanna make it clear. Maybe some people who aren't as familiar with React don't know this, and I do wanna make this open to everybody out here. So I have two tables on this page, okay? They look and say the exact same thing. Now the one up top looks a little different, there's a reason, okay? This is a real world example, okay? The first table, all right, has name, headers or name, occupation, data below it is Mark Stebbin, Accessibility Advocate. The exact same table below, so it's the exact same thing, but there's a little bit of difference in it, okay? The story I'm gonna tell really quick. Basically, there's a table of data that had a bunch of different people's names in it, okay? What they were doing was setting up the table just enough to basically send in just the data for the table over and over again. So if I jump into here, this is kind of what it looked like, okay? I have my table, I have my table row, I put in my table headers with injected data, I put in my table body with injected data. And all they wanna do is just inject data through that really quick so they can make a table really quick and go through, right? Okay, cool. So these table headers, okay, so this actual component is a separate component. So I'm gonna show you guys this separate component really quick, okay? Cool. So in this component, right, this is dumbed down just so you guys can see it really quickly, okay? This would be injected data here. So it'd be like data.name, data occupation, right? In this component itself, what they did is they said, cool, we're gonna return this, we're gonna spit it back out, we're gonna get 500 names in a table really quick, nice and easy, right? Here's the problem, okay? Um, React by default will tell you and complain to you if I take away, like I did right here, okay? If I take away the actual divs, what ends up happening is it will tell you specifically, hey, this needs to be wrapped in a closing tag. So what's the first thing a developer is gonna do? Like myself, wow, I need to put those back. Okay, cool, got it. All right, perfect. Now I'm gonna go back to here really quick and okay, why does my table look funky? Okay, why are people complaining about my tables? Well, I'm gonna pull this up so you guys can see it actually live in here. Now I have extra added semantics, okay? So my table row, all right, now has a div with my table headers, so naturally, this is broken, right? A screen reader is not gonna be able to go through this. It'd be very confusing for them to be able to get through it. it. It gets clunky for them to understand what's inside of it. 
And it makes it really difficult, right? So the first thing they ask me is, okay, well, like this is the only way we can do this in React, so I guess our tables won't be accessible. How do we do this, right? It's not the case, okay? So I'm gonna go directly back to my page I was on before, okay? Same solution here, okay? So we have table, table row, table row, okay? And we've got the headers, and we've got the table body, all right? The difference is, is this. React out of the box lets you use something called fragments, okay? So if I look at this, fragments, Okay, straight from React, basically tell it this, I don't want you to wrap in a div, I want you just to take the, the markup as is. Okay, so what it'll do is it'll just take this, these two TDs here, and then take them and put them directly back out into the page as table definitions. And now you have a nice easy table, it's gonna come back correctly and semantically correct. As simple and as crazy as that sounds, and a lot of people on this call probably already knew that, there are so many people who do not understand that concept and just keep throwing in divs over and over again. Tables are just one example. Lists are another one. Dynamically added data that are lists. Um, anything that goes along with data that needs to be added within a table, lists, data tables, right? It, it go, list goes on and on. You're breaking semantics right away, right? And you may not necessarily know that, but that's one of the big ones we see specifically with keyboard navigation. Um, another one specifically in React is custom tags. So I have two buttons on here. They look the exact same, okay? One says click me, one says click me, right? I know, from accessibility standpoint, they don't have differentiation. It's okay, it's for example purposes. So they are inaccessible, all right? Uh, I'm gonna try a keyboard tab to this first one. Well, come on now, why can't I get to that? Well, you know, let me go back to this really quick. All right, so, okay, I have a custom tag. It has a roll button, and it has tab index of zero. Why can I put focus to it? Oh, okay. This is another aha moment for keyboard navigation. If you do custom tags um, or custom components themselves, um, totally fine, 100%. You can do that because the HTML that comes from them gets rendered out in the DOM anyways. Here's the problem. You cannot add ARIA or anything after the fact to a custom tag. What ends up happening is React will completely ignore it. Unless you do some weird customization behind the scenes, it will completely ignore it. So what I have to do is actually go directly to this custom tag um, piece itself, go directly to this div that I had, add my roll of button, and my tab index equals zero. Okay, I'm going to save it, reload, come back to it, and now I can get directly to it, okay? A lot of times what we see with people that ask questions on this, they go, hey, I've made this custom tag. Let's say it's a custom button, right? They use divs for it, they just wanna be able to get it out there, it's nice and neat, it looks cool, right? Um, here's the thing, it makes it really difficult to do unless you put the semantics in the ARIA on the actual component itself, you can't actually put it on the component tag that you end up creating, right? So in this custom tag piece that I have up here that I'm highlighting, I have a roll button, a tab index of zero, it's gonna ignore it. React in general is so gonna be like, nope, you didn't put this on semantic HTML, it's in the component itself, so I don't know how to render this out, okay? And it's one of those things that's it's not known unless you mess around with it enough, right? Um, we see it so often, especially doing dev remediation, it's one of those things to watch out for when it comes to keyboard navigation. The next one with keyboard navigation that trips up even more is click events. Um, and I know we're doing a webinar, so I can't do like the everybody raise your hand, but if I ask this question, uh, one of my divs I have here, okay, it's a div that's made as a button. This one is an actual button. So if I do an on-click event on a div, I do an on-click event on a button, in theory, it should work for both, right? Wrong. So if I click this with a mouse, this pop-up will pop up and say, this worked. If I click this second button, which is marked up as a button, and click it, this works. Awesome. So if I go to it with a keyboard now and hit it, uh-oh, uh-oh. Oh, well, well, wait, the button worked. So what's happening right now? Behind the scenes, if you just put a straight on-click event on something that is not semantic, okay, I meaning semantic button, something that's supposed to be an input, what ends up happening is React does struggle with on clicks to do all. Now, JavaScript behind the scenes, yes, you can account for it with a little bit of tweaking to the code to do for keyboards, like enter would be part of it. Um, it doesn't do that for divs, spans, if you're making customized buttons with not just semantic buttons behind the scenes. You don't get both things, okay? What ends up happening is, is that your on-click event will fire, okay, just for mouse. It will not fire 
specifically for an input, like a button, okay, or a link. So what ends up inherently happening is, is people come to us and be like, well, they say it doesn't work. How do I make this work, right? Another extra step. You pretty much have to come into this one and basically do this. You have to do it on key press, on key press with the exact same event. Yes, it's duplicate code, okay? If I refresh, now come down to this, boom, it works, perfect. Just with the div. So one of the things that is pretty difficult is if you can, and I've told everybody this and you'll hear accessibility advocates all over, and I'm an accessibility advocate, I'll tell you right now, when you can use semantic HTML, use it. It gives you so much more out of the box. Even within React itself, it gives you much more, right? Now I can use this um, properly with just one on-click event on a button instead of doing on-click, on-key press, right? And heck, if you're doing some customization stuff, you have to do on specific key click events for other things too, right? So it makes it easier on you to just have that on-click event come through, okay? All right, so that kind of covers um, keyboard navigation. Now we're gonna jump into ARIA Live. ARIA Live is gonna be pretty quick um, because I'll give you some background to it and you guys kind of like, oh, so here's the deal with ARIA Live. When single page applications themselves and JavaScript frameworks, right, came about, the one thing that was really difficult to use was ARIA Live. Number one reason is because the stuff is not in the DOM. So a message would appear and basically be like, hey, you're logged in, right? That's a really standard one people use for ARIA Live. That's not there. So the screen reader does not have time to play catch up and say, hey, what just happened, right? That is still an issue. Okay, within React, I'm telling you, it's within React, Angular, Ember, all of them, still an issue. If I just put it on a tag, it really struggles to pick up an ARIA Live or a rule of alert, okay? Little rule of thumb. But however, if you use something out of the box, like a custom um, package, or use a lazy load from React itself, you give the screen reader enough time to realize that that ARIA Live has been placed and is there and it will read. Okay, so these examples that I have, I have a package that's called React ARIA Live. Um, very, very, very popular package. This package itself, um, really what it'll do, so if I actually look at the DOM itself behind the scenes, um, it actually places um, an ARIA piece on the page for you. Oop, wrong one, let me go this one, there we go. Yep, and it'll actually put a bunch of different ARIA Lives that exist on. Now, this is a little bit of overkill, but that's what it does, okay? Um, and then all you have to do is basically tell it, hey, I'm gonna put this text in here when I click this button. So there's my text that came through that says Mark is awesome, and it will read. Here's how it works. All of these packages have just the slightest delay behind the scenes because everything's put on the client and it's using React to its fullest to allow the screen reader to play catch up. Instead of you controlling the hide and show and it going, it gives it just enough time to do that. The other one that exists on here is React Alley Announcer. So if I wanna trigger a new announcement, so if I look at the code for this, um, there's just one div above it that actually has ARIA Atomic on it too. ARIA Atomic, it works pretty well, but it's gonna announce every little change to text that exists within here. Um, if I hit this button and trigger a new announcement and go inside of it, it says, here's a new announcement, okay? And it will read. Again, giving it just the littlest delay behind the scenes. But let's say you can't necessarily use either one of those, right? And if you wanna see the implementations for I'll show these to you really quick, my fault, I forgot to go back to it. So for the first one I showed you for Live Announcer, um, all you have to do is take this Live Announcer tag wrap it around wherever you want the live announcement to go to, and then put your live message itself. You can actually put it directly onto here, but I just tie it to a state event in this case. Um, and then tell it what live level you want it to do, and then boom, it'll run, okay? For the second one I showed, which is the React um, Alley Announcer, you pretty much just pull in this announcer text. Um, the text will basically be whatever you want it to be here, and you just trigger specifically when this gets handled, and it'll allow it to hide and show that, and it'll announce. Um, the more consistent one that works better is probably the first one, um, which is the React ARIA Live package. It works a little bit better. Um, the way that it, the way to get this to work 100% of the time is to lazy load a component. Now, I say that, I know it's gonna be shutters, so I'll say it one more time. This is the way it works 100%. It's not the best way, but it does work, okay? React lets you lazy load components. So for instance, I'm pulling in a component up top here, okay? I'm calling it lazy component, but really it's just an alert that I'm pulling in. You can call react.lazy and then import a specific uh, component you want to load in the page. And then when I want to bring it into my page itself, I can use this thing called suspense, 
which then has a fallback, which you can just put a uh, specific HTML in there you want to put. So for instance, some people will put like loading or like wait, please wait. Um, and then I can lazy load that component. So when it actually runs, it will look like this. Let me close out my dev tools here for a second for you guys. Boom. That shows, but I can actually hide it. And then it'll announce to you. That gives it that little delay enough for a streamer to be like, aha, there's something there. Let me actually announce it to you. Okay. So those are the multiple different ways you can deal with ARIA Live and role of alerts. It's one of those things that's just very difficult to understand until you mess around with it yourself and kind of see. But these three solutions seem to be the most consistent for making ARIA Live and role of alerts work consistently across the board. All right. So for the last one then, um, we're, we're gonna jump into um, component packages. I'm actually gonna jump back into the PowerPoint itself um, for this because these ones are kind of more of talking points. Um, okay, component libraries packages. What I mean by this for people who don't know, um, kind of like the things I was showing you with like the live announcer and then bringing the title, right? React document title. Um, these are packages you can pull from anywhere. Anybody could have made them, right? And the problem is, is that a lot of people pull these in for ease of use on development. And what ends up happening is, is the document structure, right? Uh, document structure, heading structure, landmarks, different things. They all end up being broken because these people only care about the one component they made themselves, right? And tons and tons of these packages are not tested for accessibility, not even close to tested for accessibility. Um, and most of the components only truly think about themselves when they're going through. So what you end up with is, buttons, tables, links, believe it or not, input boxes that are made with spans, um, not using native tags. So yes, it does look cool. Yes, it is sleek for you to bring in. It looks really awesome and it's easy for you to implement, but at the end of the day, it's not accessible, right? It's unreal some of the stuff that's out there that you're like, yes, this is awesome. Pull it in and all of a sudden you've got 20 accessibility issues just on one little piece you brought in. Um, here's a great example. Um, of one that's actually out there. It's a simple table. Um, sure, it's a simple table, but there's nothing in here that's a table markup whatsoever. So if I'm an accessible user, or I'm somebody who's using assistive technology to go through this, this is not gonna get read to me as a table. So it's gonna get read as static text, like I put a role presentation on it, right? Straight from the wild. So if you are looking at component libraries and packages for things to go through, make sure you do your due diligence and accessibility test them if you can, because at the end of the day, you can't actually pull these into your project and be like, well, we're using this library, there's nothing we can do about it. Guess what? If somebody comes to you and said, your site's inaccessible, guess what they're gonna say? Too bad, you use that, you have to fix it, okay? So just make sure that you have got that um, in line to test for this content when you use third-party packages, okay? So those are the big accessibility issues. I know we're moving kind of quick. I've got to get through these last couple slides here so we can get to the last couple minutes of questions on here. Um, but now I'm going to talk a little bit in general, uh, kind of about accessibility within the framework itself. What I mean by accessibility within the framework is stuff outside of, um, inside and outside of the framework itself that allows you to kind of test, um, help you, guide you through accessibility content within your application. The first one, because I'll support it because it uses Axe Core, which is our accessibility core rules engine, um, React Axe. If you guys are doing um, accessibility testing within your projects or trying to do uh, testing component wise, Use an open source library like React X. Okay, as simple as pulling in uh, one little piece of the actual DOM, so you can just pull in your actual uh, component, run Axe against it, and get 50% accessibility violations caught right then and there. Um, this will run whenever you do that actual um, unit testing of your project. And the cool thing about it is, it also is going to help you learn accessibility as you code. Um, so if you are doing accessibility testing, please highly recommend using something like React X or there's tons of other access X core integrations out there. If it doesn't fit your needs with that, use it. Um, it can help you learn accessibility and how to fix things, how to test for them holistically. Um, the other one I do suggest, and this is a little bit more beta now, um, or out of beta now, um, there's actually an ESLint plugin specifically for JSXs for Alley. Um, it's pretty effective. Um, you can do a lot of customization with it, but in line within your actual coding itself. So for instance, if you're using like VS Code um, or some type of IDE where you can pull in an ESLint plugin, um, it will catch most of the issues. Um, it's running a separate rules engine behind the scenes, but it does have some really good small things. So for instance, the image on the screen I have right now is an image that's missing an alt tag, right? It can catch stuff like that or a button that's missing um, accessible text. 
it can make that stuff and catch that for you before you even build your code and run unit test cases. Um, really simple, really easy, something you can pull in just for testing helpers. Um, those two things I highly recommend if you are doing um, specific unit testing for it. Um, okay, accessibility patches. I want to make sure that we had this in here um, because these are gaining popularity big time. Um, there are two packages that kind of go outside of um, React, but they are known um, commodities, Reach UI and Semantic UI for React. Um, Reach UI is basically accessible widgets that are plug and play within your application and completely accessible. So those widgets include accordions, dialogues, tabs, tooltips, there's modals, there's all different kinds in there. Um, straight out of the box, if you use those, they are accessible. Um, I've been able to test almost all of them and I can tell you there are very, very, very few things that I would change in the way that, that's been implemented in there. It's very well done. Um, it can help you if you're using widgets within your application to make them accessible, check it out. It's as simple as just pulling that package into your project and then boom, um, you actually have accessible widgets within your application that you can actually do some customization to as well. Um, the other one that's caught um, a lot of people's attention is Semantic UI for React. Semantic UI um, basically allows for easy creation integration of inputs and widgets um, which you can translate into Semantic HTML. It's a little bit hard to explain in like the next couple minutes, but what I'll say is, is it allows you to kind of have custom tags and then use the semantic UI to add attributes on your tags to make them into semantic HTML. As weird as that sounds, it does work. Um, it is pretty cool. It does have some good guidance on how to just basically use semantics out of the box, but it does kind of manipulate it and um, bring it back to semantic HTML. Um, it's pretty nifty. Um, I would check it out. Um, I've had a little bit of chance to play with that. Um, it is very cool, especially if you are kind of like looking at this presentation today, you're like, I don't know if we really want to do any more, you know, just flat out divs for buttons or spans with inputs. Please don't do that. Um, and I say, hey, I just want to get to semantic. Semantic UI would be something you could use as well. Um, so with that, jumping into in summary. So, React can be, it can be as accessible as any application framework with the right knowledge and right know-how. The one thing that I get over and over again from people is, is there's just not enough stuff out there that tells me specifically how to integrate this, how to do this, how to look for it, right? I will tell you, the part that comes with the territory of our job is that most people are playing catch up, right? React does have a lot of accessibility um, documentation within the framework itself. It does. Um, it's trying to get it. It's going to get better. They are well aware of a lot of the issues that exist. Um, most of their devs are actually working on some stuff to actually get most of the stuff in house. Um, so that's really good news. Um, but the big thing is, is people always ask me, you know, how, where, where do I go to? Right. If you ever run into an issue, somebody asked it, there's a lot. And I mean a lot of accessibility support in the community out there for react itself. So as we as developers, as accessibility advocates, if we continue to spread knowledge, awareness, of the issues that come with the JavaScript frameworks like React, right? Teach it to others, guide people how to remediate the issue. There's no limit as to how accessible this framework can be. And I, I holistically mean that whether you're on the fence of, yes, it can be, no, it can't be. If we can hit that middle ground of it and spread knowledge for it, we can make content that's very accessible within React. And again, we're talking about React today. This is the same issues we talk about across every JavaScript and framework, right? It's one of those things where you have to spread the knowledge. You guys are here today listening to this for a reason because you want to know what these issues are, how to remediate them, right? We got to spread the knowledge, got to spread the awareness. If we ever need anything, there is a lot of documentation out there. There's a ton of community support for accessibility. It's one search away for some of the stuff. So with that, I, Laura, will turn to you for any of the questions that we have um, specifically from presentation. Thanks. <clears throat> Great job, Mark. Um, we got a lot of questions here, so a lot of really good content um, that you just um, presented to everybody. So just a heads up, folks, if we don't get to your, con uh, to your question, don't worry. I will make sure Mark uh, will answer these by email at the end, but for now we're going to jump in and try to get these answered. So. Um, one question I see here, Mark, is how do you deal with a language switch from English to French on a single page application and notify a screen reader? Um, a screen reader doesn't seem to understand the page has switched language attribute without refreshing the page. I got you. Yeah. So that is, so I've dealt with this one before. 
and it's, it is difficult. The one thing you can do, um, especially if you're, if you're dynamically, whoops, I went away, go back. There you go. Um, if you're dynamically changing, um, content. So for instance, you're changing the language really quick in line. The one way to do it is actually have a quick refresh of the page so that screen reader can pick that up. Um, that is an acceptable way to do that. Um, because if not, the screen reader really is going to struggle with that. And you're not going to full disclosure, you're not going to break anything within react, especially if you do that. Now, um, the one thing you can do too, there actually is, um, I think the internationalization library now has a react hook in it, um, that can actually help with that. Um, it gives it a little bit of time to play catch up with it, but it is rather difficult um, without doing a reload, especially with dynamic content for languages. But I would check out the React internationalization piece because um, I'm pretty sure they have some solutions out there for that. Great, thanks. Um, I got a question here is, do you have um, time or the possibility in your build to do a quick demo of React X? Um, I, <laughs> I do not have the React X piece um, actually on. It's on my other uh, Windows machine. <laughs> this no is my Mac machine. Um, but hold on to that one, Laura, because I can respond yeah. to that one in email um, and send over that example then. Sounds good. Okay. Um, another question here then. Uh, for people looking at uh, Reach UI and using React Router, it's worth noting that, oh, this, this, never mind. Sorry, that's a comment. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> All good. Uh, next one is, have you checked out the downshift library? Have I checked out the downshift library? I can't say that I have, actually. I will actually make a note of that. Okay. Um, next question. Um, Sung is trying to build a React app using Material UI library. How is the accessibility support of that library? So um, I actually, full disclosure, um, just got done doing one um, with Angular Material. There's React Material. React Material is about the same as Angular. So I'll say it's about 70% accessible. Um, the one thing you have to watch out for in some of the widgets, if you go into the API for it, look at what it says, because it does a lot of custom accessibility like key commands, and it can get you into trouble really quick. Um, I would say it's not too bad. Um, it will need some adjustments um, as far as from an accessibility standpoint will go. Um, so if you use like a free scanner like X, um, the actual browser scanner on it, you'll see some of the issues that pop up with it. But as far as like other um, libraries go, it's actually pretty accessible. There's just some small things you have to fix when you go through with it. Great, thanks. Um, got another question here. It seems like a lot of the issues you addressed apply to regular good development, uh, not just with React. For example, uh, to use semantic code when possible, don't use divs for data tables, et cetera. Yep. Is that pretty much true? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, the thing that I talked about too, and I've wrote this previous article for DeQ, which is debunking the myth of um, accessibility with React. That was my main point in there is that a lot of people don't, but believe it or not, and I'm sure most of you in here know that you can, there's a ton of people that think that you cannot use any semantics whatsoever in React. That is not, not true whatsoever. It's as simple as if you use semantics within React, it's the same thing like the old traditional ways of doing HTML. You're going to get um, all the accessibility support from a screener standpoint and from a keyboard only standpoint, um, you get out of the box. So yeah, it, absolutely. It, that, that's the points I've tried driven across too. And a lot of people are not aware that you can actually do that. They're kind of just like, oh, that doesn't make sense. Like with React, you have to use cool stuff like divs. No, you don't. You can use, you can use semantics as much as you possibly can, it will make it even easier. So absolutely, that's exactly the point I'm trying to drive across with it. Awesome. Um, Melissa's asking, do you have any tips to get the heading tags in the right hierarchy when using a React component? <laughs> that's a really good, that's a really good question. So it is difficult with component libraries. Um, God, geez, I keep clicking the button. Um, it is difficult with component libraries to kind of see um, how this component set up. So the way that I always say is this, um, there's two things I suggest. Um, if you guys do have React libraries and you use something like Storybooks, you can kind of map out how you're going to put these all into pages. You can then see where each component is going to lie on your page in general, and you can kind of make that heading hierarchy off of that. The other thing is to make your headings almost into components um, that then you can add onto your pages themselves. I've seen it done by multiple people where they actually have the heading, uh, headings 
separate components like an H1, H2, H3 component. It sounds crazy, I know. Um, but then they can put it outside of that. And then when they make that page, it allows them to either set CSS or change content to make it easier on them. Um, so when they pull this component onto the page, they actually have that heading hierarchy. Um, so those were two things I would suggest for that. Cool, thanks. Um, so we've got a lot of questions here about React and Native. Would you say that um, a lot of the React JS uh, rules apply to React Native, or is that a whole separate topic? Um, it's somewhat of a separate topic. I I'll tell you, <laughs> it's it's a good question to ask because React Native is gaining a lot of popularity. Um, I will tell you that React Native does have a lot of the same issues I've talked about here, um, but you also start to you also start to trickle into the mobile world, um, which then of itself has its own um, little issues as far as native goes on that side. But that is kind of a whole other topic. I will tell you, if you guys are looking specifically um, for content, specifically on React Native, um, if you go out to the WCAG Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and look up some of the mobile stuff um, that's out there, like specifically guidelines that might tie to native mobile, that's what you'll get as far as um, it tying in with React Native. So that would be a good place to start to look for that. We don't have time to go through the React Native stuff, but you're looking similar enough to it, but you also are getting into the native mobile side of things, which kind of goes into a, a little bit of a different look at WCAG. Awesome, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question. Is the ESLint plugin JSX Ally, can we configure it to cover JS files as well? Uh, specifically if we have JSX syntax in the JS files? I believe so. I think it's just a generic, I, I think it's just a generic implementation um, for JSX. Now, there, if you are looking for, I showed just the JSX one on there, um, and it, full disclosure, it's been a while since I've used that. Um, there are other accessibility linters out there, like specifically for stuff like JavaScript. Um, that you can actually manipulate to it. But I do believe the JSX one still has the piece in it where you can say, hey, I'm using .js, like in my example application I showed, um, I'm using .js that will allow you um, to kind of uh, manipulate and change into um, like a different file type that goes at the end. But if not, there's other types out there as well that allow you to look at um, accessibility in different uh, types of files. Awesome. Um, so what would be a major difference between the React Axe package and the Axe browser extension uh, that DQ has our free open source project in terms of <laughs> <laughs> accessibility issues being reported? Gotcha. So you're going to get the exact same level. It, it's Axe core out of the box behind the scenes. Um, the difference is, is you're testing at component level versus a page level. So in my mind, since I'm doing accessibility testing, automation is like my thing. The Axe Scanner tool that you use in the browser is more of an integration scan, right? It's the components rendered on a full page, okay? So if you're looking at levels of tests, if you use something like React Axe within your projects um, and you tested your components, I can test to make sure my components have zero accessibility violations, right? Awesome, you get a huge high five. Now, what I can do with the Axe Scanner is when I put it all to a page, I can actually see now holistically where I stand from an accessibility standpoint. My component might be accessible, but when I put it onto a page, does it introduce a new thing? Um, that's what I like to do with a lot of um, our people when we do conversations around um, automation and accessibility testing is those two layers of test, right? If you can test at a unit level and then test at an integration level with the components put on a page, that gives you that holistic view of accessibility. And the cool part about it is, is you're using the Axe Core engine, which is going to give you the same results, right? Um, because it'll be the same versions behind the scenes that are running and it'll be consistent, right? So um, yeah, I would suggest doing that. Um, if you're looking at that, as far as differences between the two, one's more component-based, you'll probably get less um, with the component-based one just because you're looking at more condensed HTML. It's gonna run the exact same amount of checks, um, but as a page, we have those two levels. You can see if my component is 100% accessible in one spot, I go to page, now I can see um, holistically from an accessibility standpoint where I stand. Great. Um, so we have a question of the three most popular JavaScript libraries, Vue, <laughs> React, and Angular, uh, which is the easiest for accessibility? Oh, geez. I think I get, I think I get asked this question like every week. Um, so uh, I'll, okay, I'll answer with this, right? I'm going to answer this. And I'm going to give a huge caveat to it. React and Vue are pretty much tied. Angular is right behind it. So really what you're looking at is the same behind the scenes. Here's the difference. Um, React has a ton of accessibility community support. 
Vue has a lot of accessibility built in. Um, and Angular has a bunch of accessibility built in, but it's a little bit more difficult to use component life cycles and like change um, third party libraries like the material thing we brought up before. So my suggestion, my, yeah, I hate to answer this question because like it, no matter what I say, I'm gonna be like, oh no, you think that one's bad. No, I don't. It's a little, it's a lot easier. It's a little bit easier. Eh, I don't know what I would say. React, Vue, Angular, done. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Okay. Um, so is there a resource out there that you're aware of which has a list of uh, accessible React components? Uh, there actually, um, uh, th there was, it was on a blog post and it went away. And so that was awesome because I was going to, I was using that for a while to actually showcase people, hey, check these out. There's not, there is a little tidbit for you guys though. If you go look at packages themselves, um, a lot of people will tout that they're accessible. What I mean by that is, um, you'll see that lovely international symbol for accessibility, which is a little person inside the circle. And they'll say, this has been WCAG tested. If that's the case, your odds of it being legit um, go up a lot. I would still test it, but that means someone did the due diligence to try to do that. There's not a lot of people that know about that um, as far as putting that like little symbol and saying, hey, it's successful in there. Um, so it's usually not a joke. Like somebody would just do that to be like, hey, it's successful, right? No. Um, so my opinion is if you see that, um, still test, but that gives you a better chance of it being more accessible. Great. So one last question, um, and I think we've kind of touched on this, but just to fully answer it, are there tools out there to automate accessibility testing of a single page app, for example, to navigate to different pages and check each? Yep. So same thing. Um, if you used Axe, um, there's an Axe integration for something like WebDriverJS. You could use WebDriverJS itself um, to navigate pages, change pages. It all depends on the testing library that you have because if you're looking for a free integration tool, Axe is really good. There's a bunch of different integrations we have with Axe that even DeQ itself supports. And there's a bunch of integrations that DeQ doesn't support that people have made in the community. Um, but there's a bunch of different ones out there, WebDriver, JS, WebDriver IO, that are Axe integrations that basically um, allow you to do what you're just talking about, do flow tests and go through different content, allow you to kind of see different pages and test them. Um, it's a little bit different than like just testing things like that like that but if you do a separate component testing suite per, or integration suite excuse me um, you can kind of get that flow testing with those different acts integrations so yes there are different ones out there that can do that flow testing great um, so we've actually run out of time but don't worry if we didn't get to your question I'll make sure that those um, get to mark and we'll get those answered by email I want to thank everybody for attending our webinar today and I have I hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday <laughs>